from lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Still Growing. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It was a bold week in the garden this week for me. July has a way of magnifying garden to-dos that have been put off during May and June. For me, this week was a week for taking action in the garden. First, I have a white oak that died this year. And even though Phil was telling me that it had died, I didn't want to believe it. And I kept waiting for it to leaf out. It is a late bloomer. It takes a long time for this white oak to set new buds. And I kept hoping that with this crazy spring and early summer that we had had, that it was just kind of late to the game, late to the party. But that was not the case. So this white oak is something that we planted the first summer we were in our house. And it is probably the last thing my husband, Phil, ever planted. It was no wonder because the front lawn is laid out over tough clay soil and construction backfill. And that means it's no fun to dig in and it is tough for trees to grow in. And after 13 years, the white oak surrendered. And I'm guessing it was due to girdling roots. I have a tree service coming out to remove the base in a month. Month. But in the meantime, my son Will had the great learning experience of cutting it down by hand with a hand saw. So it kept him busy for a couple of hours and he learned a little bit about what it was like to cut down a tree. We now have enough firewood to get us through Labor Day. So that's one positive uh, about losing this tree. And it's also opened up some possibilities regarding the outdoor sunken living room that we have planned uh, to build later this summer. So it creates some new exciting options for us. The other plant that was a call to action for me this week was the forsythia. A few springs ago, I had a horrible case of forsythia fever. They were especially beautiful in the spring of 2010, and I fell deep in lust with this plant forsythia. I had to have it, but I had no space for it. I was determined, but I was also consciously foolish about what I was doing when I tucked it along the edge of my water feature. At the time, I knew it wouldn't work, but I was desperate to own this plant. And last fall, my water feature, which is a pondless stream, developed a few leaks and it suffered from some erosion issues, which I still haven't gotten repaired. But somehow this year, without the distraction of the stream, I could see all of the plants that were ill-placed along the stream, and this aggressively growing forsythia was at the top of the list. The time had come to face the fact that it needed to find a home where it could grow free instead of suffering from my brutal pruning, which couldn't contain it anyway. My garden girls dug it out for me, and the minute it was removed, it was as if the entire bed along the stream breathed a sigh of relief. And now things like the buffalo juniper, peony, and the filbert tree that I have planted are easily next on the list for removal and relocation. And I'm so happy to report that my forsythia will soon be enjoying the perfect site along a pond at my friend Jen's house. Lastly, I want to talk to you a little bit about seed packet storage. I collect seed packets the way some girls go for shoes and purses. Wait a minute. I do the shoe and purse thing too. So in any case, you get the idea. Seed packets are very hard for me to resist. They're inexpensive, beautiful, and informative. And I also find them quite hopeful. I always have great intentions when I'm buying seed packets. This week, I carefully went through my seed packet inventory. I probably had close to 500. Throwing out the ones that needed to go and giving away the seed packets that I knew would be put to good use with fellow gardeners and neighbors and donating the rest to CSA Gardens in my area felt so good, and it allowed me to get a better handle on my inventory. I found a nifty silverware caddy at Goodwill, and it has become the perfect seed packet store 
storage container. Now my seed packets are sorted by type and sowing time. It makes me so happy to see my seeds organized into one container. And since I store it on my front porch, my seed caddy also doubles as a cute garden display. And that's the view from up here this week. Today, I'm publishing part two of my interview with Shane Smith of GreenhouseGarden.com and the director of the Cheyenne Botanic Garden. To recap, Shane has worked tirelessly through his 36-year gardening career to nurture his passion for greenhouses and bringing horticulture to the city of Cheyenne. He's been recognized for his lifetime contribution to gardening, volunteerism, education, and stewardship. Shane casts the kind of leadership shadow that inspired his community to pass a $16 million levy to expand and renovate the Cheyenne Botanical Garden, including their greenhouse. Shane has left his mark on gardening and is creating a legacy of love for his community, its environment, and people. So before we get into the interview, the second part of the interview, I just want to quickly recap. Um, Shane's books are The Beautiful Solar Greenhouse and The Greenhouse Gardener's Companion, the second of which has experienced uh, outstanding success through the years. I think it's on its third printing right now. In part one, we had just finished talking about the key elements that make a greenhouse user friendly, the benefits of greenhouses, the ways greenhouse gardening differs from standard gardening, and then the four things that you can grow in your greenhouse. And now let's continue the interview. So if you're considering uh, building a greenhouse, you know, you were mentioning the south facing or getting a lot of sun is important. Is it like buying a house where it's location, location, location that should be the primary consideration? It really is. Um, getting, having decent southern exposure to the sun is really, really important. You know, you need at least six to eight hours of sun um, on, the, on the shadiest day. Um, meaning if there's deciduous trees around or whatnot, um, you, you need to be within 20 degrees of south, either southwest or southeast. Um, so that's, I mean, for optimal, that's, I mean, you can do a greenhouse anywhere you want. And, and we also have, you know, if you, if, if you have, a, I should say, if you have a low light situation, there are other options, they're expensive. But I would say you could build a great greenhouse in, Antarctica in the winter and have it grow food, all you need is heat and light, and you don't even need glass. You know, you can you have enough energy inputs, you can grow food anywhere, and, but uh, what we're after is minimal inputs and still getting, uh, and getting actually output rather than input. You're getting output of heat into your home in the winter, and you're getting output of food and flowers and, and nice, enjoyable plants. Okay. What are some of the other things then, I mean, aside from location, that you would say, think about these things before you embark on a greenhouse? Yeah, um, I think one really important thing is the closer to your door your greenhouse is located, the better care you're going to take care of it. Um, And the absolute best case scenario is to have the greenhouse attached to your home. Once it's attached, it becomes a, a heater. Now, it's not going to overheat your house in the summertime with a good design, um, but it will heat your home in the wintertime, and you'll find yourself just hanging out in there. Um, it's a great cure for cabin fever to wake up on a Sunday morning, grab the newspaper, grab a cup of coffee, and you should always have a couple chairs in a greenhouse where you can sit down and just hang out, and it becomes sort of a living space along with a production space. And uh, so attached is by far... Uh, southern attached is the best way to do it and second best is just as close to your door whether it be front door or back door most people will be back door as possible some people end up opting for attaching onto a barn or attaching onto a garage and that's not a bad scenario too and it will help heat those structures as well if you do it right on the south side thing is um is it's quite helpful to have access to electricity um for operating a fan there are solar power fans, however, uh, but electrical connections are a nice way to go to have that close by. Um, and also water and um, water in the winter. Now, you can quite often get by pretty good with, uh, I was talking about using a lot of barrels and drums to store water as part of a solar greenhouse to hold the heat. And um, I have rigged up in my greenhouse and many people, and I think there's even some 
kit manufacturers that sell this, and that is gutters on your greenhouse that collect the rain and the snow melt, and then deposit that moisture into your barrels on the interior of your greenhouse, so you let Mother Nature uh, provide you with the water if you don't have a readily available uh, plumbed-in water supply. That's a great idea. Yeah. So, I should go, going back to electricity, um, a lot of people are do-it-yourselfers, but be real careful when you're mixing electric with, with water. Um, you know, it, it never hurts to, uh, if you can afford it, hire an electrician or get some good consultation from somebody who knows a lot about electricity. And always, always be sure your outlets are ground fault, GFI, ground fault interrupter uh, outlets. Those are the kind of outlets you see in your sinks in the kitchen and bathrooms that have a little pop-out uh, a breaker in case they sense a uh, short, because that could save your life. Absolutely. Now, how do most gardeners find their way to owning a greenhouse? Is there kind of a typical scenario that you've seen happen over the years? Um, well, sometimes people just go whole hog, and, and I mean, you can spend anywhere from 600 bucks to $60,000 on a greenhouse, depending on how fancy you want it. So uh, the budget can be any, well, you can actually do one for zero like Isidore Lopez did. But uh, but a lot of times people will, will get an interest starting with cold frames. And they'll realize, oh man, I just grew a great crop of, uh, of carrots and lettuce all winter long. That was fun. Let's, and then I grew my seedlings for my, for my vegetable garden. Let's try something else. And then they, they start going, it becomes the gateway drug into big greenhouses. And um, there's, uh, there's a new kind of greenhouse out there that's very low cost. It's, it's called the, uh, well, I, I, I call it the uh, movable greenhouse, the pop-up greenhouse. Um, it's, it's based on the tent technology of shock corded structures. If you've ever been in a tent and set it up, you had these poles that were connected with little mini bungee cords inside. Yep. And uh, oh, about eight or ten years ago, I was invited by Kelty, the company that owns Kelty, which is big and tents and, and pack packs. Um, and I helped them design these kinds of greenhouses using that technology. So it was uh, shock corded aluminum poles. And instead of a tent over those poles, it was a woven polyethylene the UV resistant woven polyethylene. And so we could cover, uh, you know, a eight by eight space for a cost of two to $300. And we could fit the whole thing in a duffel bag, just like you'd fit a tent in a duffel bag. So we could just, uh, th- these would be movable, temporary, pop-up, walk-in cold frames. And then we'd fill up some 50 gallon drums inside and ink for water to hold the thermal mass, the heat of the air. And they'd be great, season extender and in Cheyenne I even started using them as a hail protector because I could get them up in about 20 minutes when I saw hailstorms were coming our way but uh, so there's that technology which is very accessible to people at a low price the Chinese have since kind of stolen the idea and uh, build them um, much cheaper than the first ones that were built by the folks that own Kelty uh, they're out there and uh, they're almost an impulse item and uh, it that's not going to be the same as a full-fledged attached or unattached greenhouse kit that's made with quality materials and quality doors and vents and fans and that sort of thing. And uh, you step into that, and now you're going to be spending somewhere between, oh, bottom end, 1000 bucks all the way up to about, you know, seven or $8,000, depending on, on the quality of the kit materials and that sort of thing. In fact, I, I just wrote a piece in the April issue of Mother's News on how to select a kit, and there's a link to that on my website at greenhousegarden.com if anybody's interested in thinking about uh, going with a kit. I loved that article, Shane. In fact, that's why I wanted to interview you today. I also understand from reading through your materials that greenhouses kind of fall into a couple different categories. There's freestanding and attached. Could you give us uh, a quick overview of each of these types of greenhouses for folks who aren't familiar with them? But there's, there's the freestanding greenhouses is just the greenhouse that's out in your yard. You know, it's, it's not attached to your home. And uh, it's just next to the vegetable garden or something. And the attached would be actually physically attached onto your house. And that requires that you start thinking about it. 
you know, because it's, it's going to become part of your living space. So you might want to up the quality a little bit. You also might want to make sure you're not just using polyethylene or a, or a film type of glazing where somebody could get into your house through your greenhouse really easily. Um, when you attach a greenhouse, you want a pretty solid structure and a solid glazing material like glass or a good quality multi-layer polycarbonate material um, or acrylic. And acrylics are coming on as a kind of another big change in glazing. Um, but really, the other the other kind is sort of the temporary pop-up greenhouse, like I was talking about before. That's more of a temporary walk-in cold frame. Okay. Kind of greenhouse. Kind of like a homeowner's version of a high tunnel, especially if you put things in to help it go even better, like a, a water containers to help uh, hold the heat a little bit better. You mentioned earlier about the article you wrote for Mother Earth News, which is all about how folks should go about choosing a greenhouse kit. I'll make sure to have a link to that article on our show notes. But I'm just wondering if you could quickly give folks kind of the Cliff Notes version of how to choose a greenhouse kit. Uh, well, you know what? When I was approached by Mother Earth News, they were like, tell us in an article everything you can think of about greenhouses in a nice article. And, and then I said, well, it's about building a greenhouse. And I said, well, that's way too broad. That would take a book right there. And we finally, I said, you know, I'm barely going to get it all in into one, uh, one simple uh, article just on how to pick out a kit because it is quite complicated. There's so many different things to consider. Um, you really have to uh, be thinking about a lot of different things. Number one, you start thinking about is what your budget is and what can you afford. And uh, one thing I always tell people is go for the biggest greenhouse you can buy because you're going to wish you had more space. So don't get too cheap on yourself. But uh, but then you've got to start considering things like um, a lot of shopping for a kit greenhouse is shopping for a company. There's a lot of companies out there that are just resellers. There's a lot of companies out there that actually build and sell and market their own product. And there's companies that, that do both of those things. Um, so I tell people, you know, it's really important to, to check out your, your vendor first. You know, how long have they been in business? Are they a fly-by-night internet company? You know, um, do they manufacture it themselves? Uh, what, what kind of warranties are they offering? What kind of technical help? Uh, everybody has a problem putting up a kit greenhouse. Usually they're not insurmountable at all, but I want to know if they have somebody I can call on a Saturday afternoon with a question, uh, with an answer to my question. Um, and then it's also kind of interesting uh, to start getting into, okay, how's it going to be shipped? What's your shipping costs? Um, how do you package it? You know, what happens if it arrives damaged? You know, those sorts of things are important. So shopping for a company, another thing before you ever even start to, to shop for a kid is you better check out your local regulations. Some people live in places that have all kinds of uh, rules and regs and, and uh, communities have all kinds of covenants. And you don't want to get a greenhouse up and find out that you're in, in big trouble. So check out all that first. Check out your site. Make sure your site's suitable for a kit greenhouse. Uh, thinking about some of the things we talked about earlier in, uh, in terms of light and access to water, electricity, that kind of thing. And then you're just looking around at, at the framing um, of the greenhouse. There's wood, there's cedar and redwood in the way of wood. There's uh, metal framing. Um, there's um, aluminum framing. There's rust-resistant types of metal framing. And, um, and there's even plastic framing, which uh, I don't like too much myself um, for a variety of reasons. But, uh, you know, and avoid the absolute cheapest greenhouse. Cheap, as my old friend once said, uh, cheap is expensive. Sometimes you think you're saving a lot of money, and in the end, you're not getting anything that you thought you were getting, and you're repairing and fixing and having trouble dealing with, with what you bought. Um then the other choice to consider is what kind of glazing do you want on your kit? And you'll find a lot of the manufacturers sell um, a lot of options, double glazing, triple glazing, five layer thick glazing. Um, do you want glass? Do you want double glass? Do you want acrylic? Do you want polycarbonate? Do you want a polyethylene? Do you want an extruded polyethylene? There's just lots of different choices, lots of different costs. Um, you also want to look at the quality of the door on a kit. There's really cheap doors that don't seal very well. There's uh, 
high quality doors and I think doors are often overlooked. You've got to make sure you're ordering the right amount of ventilation for your climate. Um, greenhouses, uh, the people build their own either kits or from scratch. One of the biggest mistakes people do is don't provide for enough ventilation. And overheating is a much bigger problem than anybody realizes when they before they get into greenhouses. And they, they don't understand that it's not good to have your greenhouse running upwards into the mid and upper 90s and low 100s. Uh, that will destroy your tomatoes from setting on blooms. That will destroy most of your fruiting crops from, from uh, producing. You've got to keep those temperatures within good, um, good areas, and, and good would be somewhere between 70 and 85. How are you accomplish that. So you need to look at venting. You might even have to look at a cooling system, whether it would be uh, an evaporative system or an actual cooling system, or you just regularly go out and mist your own plant yourself and keep the temperatures down. Yeah. And, uh, so anyway, you can see it, it, it's, it gets way more complicated than one might imagine when you first start, start shopping. But I, I pretty much uh, packed it all in in the article in Mother of News. So yes. that'll help folks that need a little more detail. Yes, absolutely. And then is there any, um, are there any vendors out there that you have a particularly soft spot in your heart for? Uh, companies that you think really do a nice job? Well, I'm sure there's a lot of companies that do a great job that I don't know about. I, um, on my website, I do have a page where people can post reviews of greenhouse kit companies, and not every kit has a review. And um, and I encourage those companies, you know, that that don't to have the people that are pleased send in reviews. But um, but I have uh, probably one of the oldest uh, greenhouse supply for homeowner companies. Uh, They've been in the business as long as I've been in the business, and that's Charlie's Greenhouse Supply out of uh, uh, Mount Vernon, Washington. Char- I know Charlie personally. He's a, a great guy, honest guy. Charlie and Carol uh, have done a great job with their company. They, they manufacture some of their own, and they also uh, sell other products of kits that other people have, and they sell everything else that goes with it. There's another company I like a lot. Uh, for people who are going to build their greenhouse from scratch, I've uh, had a great uh, or a working relationship with uh, Sundance Supply. And on his website, he's got uh, nice calculators for how much glazing uh, you need and some basic design instruction. Um, and he sells a really nice quality polycarbonate one that seems to be getting a lot more years than the typical 10 years. It's uh, the product he sells uh, has not just the UV treatment on the exterior, but I think it's on all sides of the uh, Blazing, and uh, he really buys it by the bulk, so his prices seem to be pretty good. Like I say, there's probably a lot of other folks out there that have, have good quality stuff. Check out my my reviews out there that uh, people have helped with, and you'll you'll see a lot more um, possibilities for kit. Or seeing some neat things out there. Some people are. I saw one company was developing a, a kit that the whole roof lifts off for ventilation. Um, that was a unique thing. I'd never seen that before. Wow, and I love that you're doing the reviews on your website. Yeah, nobody else really has them, you know, focused on greenhouses. So, um, you know, it's not a it's not a big commercial item, but really, my website is is um, yes, it does have advertising on it. But no, I'm not there to sell anybody any one thing, um, and I don't accept ads. Uh, well, I've got the basic Google ads that I can't control, um, but the the other ads that I have. Um, are, are people that I that I do trust, but um, but like I say, the information on my site is, is uh, I'm biased, and I'm just putting it out there and and trying to inform people so they can make good decisions on their greenhouse. Yep, I love that. I love that. Now, within any greenhouse, are there a number of microclimates like within the greenhouse? Yeah, that's another consideration that's different than the garden. And there are microclimates in the garden, but in the greenhouse, there really are microclimates. Up against the glass can be really hot and dry and brutal in the summer. Um, up against the glass can be really cold and, and frosty in the winter. Um, the, the back wall of a solar, solar greenhouse have even more microclimates than a regular greenhouse that has glass on all sides. Solar greenhouses only have glass mainly on the south uh, roof and south vertical face. 
Um, so if you have a solid north wall, which is what's recommended for solar greenhouses, now you've got a situation quite often where in back, uh, if you're solid, you have partial solid roof, partial or maybe full solid wall, you can end up with some pretty shady areas in the summer back there and very sunny areas in the winter, but a little more moderate temperatures. And so thinking about the microclimate, where you're going to set each plant in the uh, in the greenhouse or even the solar greenhouse is important. Also, if you do have water, you can help create your own thermal mass water in containers. A plant growing next to a 50-gallon drum filled with water is benefiting from that microclimate uh, just like... Um, you know, Western Michigan is benefiting from the Great Lakes, um, and they can all of a sudden grow fruit there, you know, and just why it's always a more moderate climate next to the ocean compared to coming inland. Um, you're sort of using water the same way in a greenhouse, a solar greenhouse. Do you have uh, some other tips for making a greenhouse energy efficient? Uh, yeah, um, for energy efficiency, of course, we mentioned the multiple layers of glazing. That's essential. Um, you really have to have multiple layers um, in order to, uh, for instance, uh, if I just had single glass, that greenhouse is going to run 10 degrees hotter during the day and 10 degrees colder at night than if I switch to double glass. And if you go triple, it's even more pronounced uh, buffering. Um, so that's real important. Another thing, um, of course, we talked about um, sealing things up. Uh, you know, everything's really got to be uh, weather tight. Seal every nook and cranny. You know, vents, doors, that kind of thing. Um, insulated north uh, for solar greenhouse. Insulated north wall is almost essential. Uh, maybe some of your north roof. Maybe even your east and west walls or partially east and west walls should be insulated. Everything inside a solar greenhouse that isn't a drum or a plant or a walkway should be painted white to reflect the maximum amount of light onto your plants. Um, it's important to insulate the foundation of a greenhouse. And even if you don't have a foundation, um, I just set my more, I just built a new greenhouse last summer, and I set my greenhouse on some six by six uh, timbers. But adjacent to the six by six timbers, I trenched down two feet and sunk some vertical styrofoam, two inch thick wide um, styrofoam, so that I would not, lose the soil heat to the cold winter soil outside, nor would the cold winter soil conduct into my greenhouse. So insulating vertically your foundation, or at least the perimeter of your greenhouse, can make a gigantic difference. In warmer temperate climates, it's not such a big deal. My website, I've got a nice little chart that will show you just how way much more efficient water can hold heat than anything else, concrete, you name it. Um, and water's cheap. It's easy to fill up a drum and and have it start working for you. Um, so those are the basics. If you, uh, one other thing is if you're in a real cold climate, having a storm door or sort of an airlock entry type of door way so that you're, you're not opening the door and losing all your heat in one fell swoop, that you walk into kind of an intermediate airlock entrance. Now, I've seen some comments that expert gardeners often have the most trouble switching to greenhouse gardening. Why do the experts have more trouble than, say, novice gardeners? Well, I think uh, expert gardeners want to tweak everything and they overthink everything and they tend to overdo everything. Um, sometimes novice gardeners are a little more ruthless and, uh, and maybe not quite as uh, overthinking it. And, and expert gardeners, you know, they've quite often they've got a lot of years under their belt. They've taken master gardener classes and by George they've learned this is how you do something. And then you walk in a greenhouse and they're going to keep doing it that way. They're not quite as open of a book as somebody who's just starting out. So uh, that has a lot to do with it. But once they get the hang of it, they do. And, and I really tried to write my book, Greenhouse Gardener's Companion, in a way that both talked to the expert gardeners and the novices. And I tried to do it in sort of a fun way, too, and a lot of personal anecdotes. Um, so I really, uh, if you really want to drill into, you know, the technicalities of how you pollinate an eggplant, it's there. Um but if you just want to know the basics, uh, it's all there too. Is there something when you think back on all the gar or all the greenhouse experience you've had? Is there something that makes you chuckle? Something you did that just didn't work out? Oh gosh, you know, a lot of what makes me chuckle are the people that that 
volunteer and work in our Cheyenne Botanic Gardens greenhouse. Um, and then, of course, I've made plenty of my own stupid mistakes, you know, where, where you're um, mixing a fertilizer up too strong or do, overdoing something. Um, you know, and one of my favorite fertilizers is fish fertilizer. So, so for a few days, it feels like my, my greenhouse moved to the coast of Seattle where they're dumping the fish. Um, but, you know, everybody really has a good time uh, in a greenhouse and it's, it's, uh, everybody makes mistakes and, you know, we all, we all learn from it. And um, what was it that Thomas Jefferson said? I'm, I'm but an old man, but I'm still a young gardener, something to that effect. And uh, you're never too old to, to keep learning new things. And I sure don't know it all. Now, how do you recommend greenhouse gardeners combat greenhouse menacing pests like white flies, aphids, and spider mites? Boy, they're all challenging. Um, and uh, I think number one is being a good observer because all of those pests tend to sneak up on you. Um, they tend to hide on the underside of the leaves, and you need to get out there and be on patrol on a regular basis because it's way easier to control it infestation early in, this, in their uh, population rise rather than when they're full-blown uh, infestation. So that's number one. Um, and then uh, you, you need to kind of make a decision early on about uh, how you're going to go about controlling bugs. And I should point out every new greenhouse has a honeymoon period where you don't hardly have any pests. So don't think you're home free with that new greenhouse. They're going to come. Okay. Uh, you can slow it down, however, by not taking on anybody's gift plants. That's the quickest way to get your first infestation. Um, just grow everything yourself from seed and and uh, avoid those uh, things people are trying to dump off on you. And uh, and so as far as uh, some of the specifics, you, you, yeah, we have some really good uh, beneficial controls for a lot of these critters. We have a beneficial spider mite that eats the bad spider mites. It does a wonderful hard work and job. We've got a uh, wasp that uh, microscopic, almost smaller than a fungus net wasp that will never sting you, but does a, just a stellar job of controlling aphids. We've got a few different critters on white fly. Um, they're probably the, the white fly are probably the biggest challenge to most greenhouse gardeners. Um, but we do have some beneficials that work them over a couple different kinds of wasps and, and a predatory beetle. Um, and uh, mealybug, we've got a great little beetle that actually goes through an, a stage of his uh, development where it actually looks like a mealybug. Talk about a, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, this, this guy literally does that. I don't know if he's involved to do that to sneak up on mealybug or what, but if you don't know that, you might think you've got a big infestation when you release these beetles, but it's really the beetles that look like mealybug for a short while. And then they sneak up on them and eat them for lunch. Um, and then we've got a lot of general predators that just go around and keep, keep things clean. Spiders are not bad in greenhouses as long as you made friends with them. Um, there's some spiders you might not want in there, but little guys are just fine. Um, as are lacewing flies. I'm a big fan of lacewing flies for controlling bugs. But I have to say that, especially initially, going into biocontrols can be kind of expensive. Um, and it's really expensive on the shipping end because they do overnight shipping and that's never cheap. And it's very smart to hook up with a, with a group of friends that have greenhouses and you can share the cost because it, it doesn't take much more to ship 2,000 lace wings than it does 1,000 lace wings and you can uh, share in the shipping cost. So partnering up with other greenhouse growers can help save you a lot of money if you're going to go the route of more biocontrols. And if you go that route, if you make that decision, that means you can't go out there and spray just anything. I don't care if it's organic or not. Um, if, I, if I go out there and, and spray uh, a botanically based pyrethrum, I'm going to wipe out all my good guys, even though it's an organic spray. Even soap can kill my good guys. So you have to really become uh, knowledgeable about what you can spray, where you can spray, and how you can spray. Um, you can go that route. Another route is to decide I'm not going to do any beneficials. I'm just going to try to fight it, fight it with physical controls. And so you use hopefully the most environmentally, uh, biologically sane materials you can, which tend to be botanically based and soaps um, and uh, traps and uh, yellow yellow boards with uh, axle grease on them. You can catch a lot of white flies. It's not going to get rid of everything, but it might help you monitor things. 
um, so you can go that route. And one of my favorite controls for bugs is hard sprays of water, especially these soft-bodied guys. Um, if, if you can get out there and spray the undersides of the leaves once a week with a hard upward spray, you can knock 90% of your bugs off. You end up breaking their legs, breaking their backs, and, and very few of them survive that. If they do, um, they're, in, they're not in great shape. And you can really keep the greenhouse clean with just plain old water. And there's actually a, a product out there. There's probably more on the way. There's a, a somebody's developed a, a nozzle just for spraying the undersides of the leaves. And I believe it's under the name thebugblasters.com. You can check that out if I have that right. And uh, and even though it's a nice product, whether you use their product or spray yourself with your thumb on the end of the a nozzle. No matter what, plan on getting wet. Yes. <laughs> you use water to control things. It just splashes around and you get wet. It's nice to do on a warm day. And luckily, we do tend to get less bugs in a solar greenhouse in the winter, so you're not. it's not as much fun to get wet. Uh, the pest problems are generally more on the warm seasons. But, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of information on my book about, about the bugs and also quite a bit on my website. There's a learning curve. And as you were talking about the upward spray, I keep thinking about the Starbucks folks and all the coffee shop folks, folks who have those upward sprayers to clean out their blenders. Oh, you yeah. know, so maybe you turn and, and it when you do apply any sort of pesticide, whether it's uh, of, of any source, uh, whether it's soap or, or botanical or whatever, um, apply it to the underside of the leaf is the main thing, to, is the main goal. Top side, it's not going to, if you, if you just spray the tops of the plants and walk out and think you're done, you're going to have another uh, rude awakening. Got to get the undersides of the leaves. That is a great tip for folks that probably a lot of people overlook. Right, right. These guys start their parties on the undersides, not where you can see them. Huh. And they can grow exponentially. Aphids are almost, well, aphids are born pregnant and don't need to mate. So if... When aphid has uh, five or six kids, and those guys are all born pregnant, you got big problems. I kind of feel sorry for them. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> now, how common are molds and diseases in greenhouse gardening? Well, diseases can be uh, a big problem, and molds, of course, too. But I, I find a lot of that is tied to overwatering. If you can temper your water, especially in the winter, you can do a good job of keeping diseases down. Um, so, so that's number one. Your, your watering can make or break if you're not really conscious of, of whether your plants really, really need to be watered or not. And don't and put a valve on the end of your hose so you're not getting the ground all wet um, where you don't need water. Uh, just put water where you need it. And uh, if you are having a particular problem, the number one thing you do is you look for resistant varieties. Um, there's a lot of plants out there that are resistant, that, that have been bred to be resistant to powdery mildews or, or other kinds of problems, and a lot of resistance in tomatoes. And then finally, one thing I've discovered that seems to have a wonderful effect on diseases is, of course, good soil, good organic soil compost, but also uh, fish fertilizer um, has been found by some research, and I can sure back it up with my own experience, that um, you can... Uh, by putting the fish fertilizer in, it has some effect, and I'm not even sure scientists know what it is, but it seems to suppress diseases. Uh, I've had incredible luck with that. So you just have to remember, it's a high nitrogen fertilizer. You don't want to keep using it forever on fruiting crops because it might inhibit your fruiting crops. But uh, it, is a, uh, it is a great fungicide in and of itself. And the other thing I found out is fungicides are not great fungicides. Um, it's pretty rare when a fungicide gets rid of a fungal disease. Um, yeah, most pesticides will kill a bug, but fungicides, it's a lot of money, a lot of headache, without a whole lot of great results. I tend to hardly ever, ever, ever use a fungicide. What do you do instead? Fish. Okay. Just use a fish fertilizer. There are some, uh, for some tougher case, well, fish and resistant varieties. Um, or it might just pull the plant out and be ruthless. Um, and there are lots of home remedies out there using baking soda, and baking soda can help quite a bit, too. Okay. So let's say that uh, I just put my greenhouse in, and I go over to your house, and I'm like, Shane, come with me. Help me stock this greenhouse. What would you tell me to grow so that I could be successful right off the bat? 
Well, I, number one, I would interview you and find out what do you want, what's going to make you happy. Because if I say you should just grow radishes year-round in here and your kids don't like radishes, we've got a big problem. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so I would I would interview you and make sure we're doing what you want to do. You know, do you, is this going to be a, a fun place for your kids to hang out? Well, they, they might like... Uh, they might like some winter snapdragons because they could turn them into puppets. And they might like uh, a small fig tree that they could uh, make their own homemade fig newtons in the summertime. And they might like a banana tree. Um, they might like, you know, so you might want to get into some strawberries and uh, grow those. Or, you know, it just, it just really comes down to personal preference. And the big thing is you have to be ruthless. You don't just take any old plant. Um, you really need to follow your passion. If you just let people give you their plants or you grow what you think you're supposed to grow, you're not going to take good care of it. But if you're growing things you've always had an interest in, if you wanted to grow a bonsai, if you wanted to grow an orchid all your life, um, let's try a vanilla orchid or let's try a real uh, orchid that smells like chocolate. Um, or let's, you know, whatever your passion is, you follow it in the greenhouse and um, that way you'll take the best care of it. You've mentioned that a few times. So people must just start giving you plants when they see you've got a greenhouse. Yeah, that's not good. It's not good. <laughs> you need to be the person that gives the plants away rather than them give them to you. It's the mark of a ruthless gardener, and a ruthless gardener is a good gardener. How common is it for a gardener to abandon a greenhouse once they get it going? So they start it, and then they say, you know what, I can't do this. Does that happen quite often? Oh, I don't think it's a whole lot. Um, you know, quite often people get old and, and just can't physically do it anymore. Um I have seen occasions where people move and leave a greenhouse and then somebody inherits one that's kind of fallen apart and the glazing's gone bad and they need a, need a whole reworking. Um, I see a lot of greenhouses that don't get near the proper use associated with schools, you know, where they get a grant and they put a greenhouse in and then the, the science teacher changes and now nobody wants to take care of their greenhouse, which is a real shame. But, uh, but no, it's not, it's not a real common thing. Usually it's a selling point. Usually uh, having a decent greenhouse on your property is going to increase your your sales price, the value of your property. Um, However, one that's decrepit and falling apart is not going to help anything. Yes. Now, you've said a few times, and I've read many quotes that are attributed to you around being a ruthless gardener. The quote I'm thinking of is one where you said, most of us are too kind. The ruthless gardener is the best gardener out there. How has your gardening experience shaped this opinion? Oh, well, I, I in my younger days, was not a ruthless gardener, which was really embarrassing to be a, a, a university-trained horticulturalist and not be very good at gardening. <laughs> Yeah, and it was because I wasn't ruthless enough. So I've learned over the years, uh, thanks in part to my mother, who was a wonderfully ruthless gardener, um, that that's a key. And that's actually a, a, a book I'm working on right now, and it's a lecture subject that I've uh, I've given my lecture on ruthless gardening across the country, and I have a lot of fun with it. It's a very fun, uh, humorous, crazy sort of talk, but I have more people come up to me that... that look me in the eye and say they've forever changed how they're going to look at their garden, their house plants, their yard, their trees, their shrubs, as a result of what I talk about in terms of being ruthless. And it just comes down to kind of being tough love for tough love for your garden, your plants, your house plants, whatever. So one, one tenant or one piece of advice, a call to action that you could give to folks listening to this podcast to become more ruthless, what's one, one or two things that they could do? to be more ruthless over this throw summer. Out that, throw out that poinsettia. Are you still sitting on a poinsettia out there? Throw it away. <laughs> That's where you start. Um, yeah, the, the one tenet I always tell people is, uh, for instance, uh, people who aren't ruthless have trouble thinning their plants. Um, so what they need to do is they thin their plants after their teenager uh, gets their first tattoo or piercing or after you pay your cell phone bill, or after you've had a heated argument with your spouse. Perfect time to go out and be ruthless in the garden. Take out your anger out there. Okay. And you'll come back with a nice smile on your face. (laughs) Take it out on the plants. Right. (laughs) 
Well, aside from the plant material, what other tools should gardeners have at the ready in their greenhouse? So if I walk into your greenhouse or your home greenhouse, what are some of the tools that you love to use? Well, I've, one of my tools, both inside and out, that I've always liked is just the basic Japanese weeder, also known as a Hari Hari. And the way to get an image in your mind is, uh, everybody knows what I'm talking about when I mention a crocodile Dundee's knife. Yes. It looks like a big knife, although it's not sharp and deadly like crocodile Dundee's, but that's what it looks like. But you can use it to plant, to prune, to dig, you know, to cultivate. Um, so that's, that's one I like. And when you're walking around your yard with it, 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 it keeps people away. It's, you know, they don't mess with you at all. They see that big old knife and think you're some crazy gardener. But it's a great tool, and it comes in handy all the time. It has a serrated edge on the side, um, so that's helpful. And then, what, you know, there aren't really, you know, you need a, a shovel to dig it under. One, you know, one thing I do is uh, I don't like greenhouses that are sitting on a slab of concrete. I like my beds connected to the earth, whether they're raised or ground beds. And so, therefore, you know, a shovel that can dig kind of deep is nice to have. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as tools, I like valves on all of my hoses. I don't like to have the water just run when it's on. I turn it off between plants, turn it off uh, when I'm done watering and reaching for the valve to turn it off at the main spigot. So a valve right at your, your fingertips. I like, a, uh, I like a nozzle on the hose that has a... Uh, has very tiny holes uh, in it uh, that, that spreads the water out nicely. Um, you always have to have a nice watering can. Um, if you're starting seedlings, you need a very tiny little spout on your watering can. You need one of those. Uh, so just kind of the basics, but nothing really unique to greenhouses. Okay, awesome. Now, I heard you recently gave a talk about the future of gardens. What were some of the key points of that presentation? Oh, I'm trying to think which talk that was, but um, I think the technology is changing. I think uh, we've, we're facing some big challenges in uh, in genetically modified organisms coming into our own yards. Uh, you know, and, and horticulturalists are pros at modifying organisms. We've been doing it forever. Um, but some of the studies I'm seeing on, on, I'm sure some of the genetically modified crops are, are not that, but I'm sure some others may well have some, some big implications. So that's worrisome, I think, to all gardeners because uh, it's scary when, it, you know, we think we can control our own property lines, but when things start coming in through pollen um, or other ways, it, it gets a little bit scary. So, so that's worrisome. Um, and I'm seeing a, a, a wonderful trend now in urban gardens. I mean, that's the big thing. We're seeing uh, people raising uh, chickens and bees and, uh, and and even goats in urban settings. We're seeing more and more community gardens. Uh, the, the demand for community gardens is through the roof. Um, so I think these are all really good trends for the future as far as gardening. Um, Sadly, we're seeing a lot of our garden magazines struggling, um, dealing with the whole new media of the internet. But you know, people like you are doing on the other side really fun, creative things to get the word out on gardening in other ways. So that's that's going to be interesting to the future. I think I think we're looking at a lot more apps out there. You know, there's there's uh, so much creativity. Um, the apps where you can just ask or look at a garden question and have it in your app, have it answered. Um, the leaf snap app is really fun for anybody interested in plants. They just take a picture of the leaf on a white piece of paper, and, it, and in fact, they get an answer as to what that plant is. Um, I think the uh, I think it's great that citizens are getting more and more interested in phenology in their yards. Um, that's where you're, you you look at and time things based on nature. So you would say, uh, I always plant my corn when the Elm leaves are, uh, you know, an inch big. You know, so you time one thing in nature to another thing in your garden. And we're finding if you keep records like a gardener should, um, you start to see trends that, hey, things are getting warmer, things are getting weirder, things are getting cooler, um, things are changing. And noticing that and keeping track of that is, uh, I think, helpful to gardeners. And seeing lots of crazy changes in the climate. Yes, and Native Americans did that all the time. They always planted according to what the earth was doing instead of what day it was. Right, right. So 
I think that's that's uh, important stuff, and I'm seeing a big increase in that. And there's whole internet-based citizenry uh, input where people are starting to able to see trends across the the world, and uh, you know we're able to get data like we never have before. So okay. Okay, so if people want to get a hold of you, what is a good way to get a hold of you? Greenhousegarden.com. Awesome. And do you have any upcoming events? Um, I don't right now. I, I uh, lately try to have been trying to limit some of my lecturing, um, but uh, they come they come and go. Okay. But right now I'm, I'm focusing on uh, breaking ground for the Cheyenne Botanic Garden, so that's yeah. kind of sucking the oxygen out of the room. Yep, absolutely. Yep, yeah. that's going to be a big one. That that'll be uh, uh, that's well. How many years is that going to take for you? Is that three like years. A, three? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe even a little longer. Yeah, you're going to be eat, sleeping, breathing that. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of how it is, but but it'll, it's a good problem. And there are things that you'll be able to do on that, uh, you, you know, during the off season, right? You'll be able, you'll be a lot of things construction wise, planning wise, and otherwise. Oh yeah. That, okay. Yeah, we're going to be doing stuff year round as far as construction. So, wow, that's exciting. Yeah. And, you know, if anybody wants to keep track of that, that is botanic, uh, excuse me, botanic.org. Botanic.org to keep track of what's going on on that. On the Cheyenne Botanic Gardens and our construction. Yes. And news from there. Now, yeah. do you have a name for this project or this, this next phase? Have you named it? Is it like? No, it really doesn't have a name. Okay. It's just renovation and expansion. Well, Shane, I want to thank you for being on the show today. It's really been a pleasure, and you've been so generous with your time and information. And I would love to have you back on the show to talk to you more about your day job with the Cheyenne Botanical Garden, as well as the whole new project that you've got going with that levy you got passed. Would that be okay? You bet. Love to do it. Shane, you're you're just a very practical, you're easy to listen to, um, lifetime of experience. Can't beat it. Well, thank you. Okay. Yeah. This was really fun. My pleasure. Enjoyed it. We'll, we'll be in touch. Well, that's it for our show today. I want to thank Shane Smith of GreenhouseGarden.com and the Cheyenne Botanic Garden for being my guest. You can find this podcast on iTunes as well as Stitcher and the BlackBerry Podcast. You can also subscribe directly to the blog post to get them via email. I'll have all the information from the show today at SixFootMama.com. That's the number 6, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And you can find this episode in the top menu under Still Growing Podcast. You can always find me at sixfootmama.com or on facebook.com backslash still growing with six foot mama. You can also email me directly at jennifer at sixfootmama.com. Feel free to send in your questions for the Master Gardener Roundtable, which airs every other month on Still Growing. Your question will be answered either via email or during the podcast. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a sixfootmama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is an hour-long weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Okay, so at the end of every podcast interview for Still Growing, I usually put together some outtakes. Sometimes it's funny false starts or moments that happen during taping. Other times I record my children reading poetry, telling garden stories, etc. These little micro recordings have become a favorite part of my podcast. My kids are always very interested in learning about my guests, and I know I will cherish the sound of them just as they are now at the end of nearly every podcast. In honor of my interview with Shane Smith of GreenhouseGarden.com, the kids and I thought it would be fun to close out the show with some greenhouse poetry, but we couldn't really find that much. And so we created our own. We specifically created 10 greenhouse haikus, and the kids are going to read them now. We'll start with PJ. The greenhouse, honey. No, the new greenhouse. Uh, Ready? Go. The new greenhouse. Greenhouse honeymoon stopped abruptly with gift plant and infestation. John? Hello. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Two. The inconvenient greenhouse. 
I built a greenhouse far away from my front door. Now I use it not. Emma? Number three, finally. I longed for a place to grow tomatoes year-round. Voila, a greenhouse. Number four, pests. Shoe, greenhouse pests. White fireflies. No, white flies. White flies. Aphids. Spider mites. Sprayed water kills you. Number five, plant boss. Rooflet, ruthless gardening say ruthless gardening ruthless gardening farewell christmas poinsettia 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 perfect let's do it one more time five number five plant boss ruthless ruthless gardening farewell christmas poinsettia poinsettia (laughs) poin poin poinsettia (gasps) like coin except poin number five Plant boss. Wolfless gardening. Farewell, Christmas poinsettia. Who's the plant boss now? Number six. Fish emulsion. <laughs> I said emulsion. You said perfect. That's right. Number six. Fish emulsion. Emulsion. <laughs> em, em, emulsion. Okay. N- number six. Fish emulsion. I'm not. I don't emulsion. like that. Emulsion. Emulsion. <laughs> Number six. Number six. Fish emulsion. <laughs> Number six. Fish emulsion. Fish fertilizer. Powerful fungus killer. You suppress disease. Number seven. Microclimates. Hot, cold, warm. You have to say microclimates. Pause. And after every line, you do a little pause. Ready? Okay. Go. So number seven. Microclimates. Hot, cool, warm, and cold. Michael Clements. Microclimates. Michael Clements. Microclimates. <laughs> Number seven. Microclimates. Hot, cold, warm, and cold. Michael Clements. Climates. Microclimates. Hot. Say number seven, though. <laughs> Number seven, Michael Climate <laughs> Climates. Okay, right, number seven, Michael Climates. No. <laughs> micro, micro. Okay, number seven, Micro Climates. Hot, cold, cool, warm, and hot, cold. Cool. Not cool. <laughs> Ready, go. Hot. Cool, warm, and cold. Microclimates keep it all. Right? Michael, microclimates. Number seven, microclimates. Hot, cool, warm, and cold. Microclimates. Pain to floor. Don't forget to vent. Phew. Okay, next. Number eight. Minnesota greenhouse. Snow is falling down. White makes the greenhouse warmer. Minnesota, psych! Number nine, plant party. Greenhouse gardening, spoiling winter's grip at last. My plants party on. Number ten, the sands greenhouse gardener. My plants are dormant. Clean garden gloves are paired up. Spring will never come. Thanks for helping, everybody. Can I have my $3?